ಸರ್ ನಿಮ್ ಸ್ಕ್ರೀನ್ ಲೈವ್ ಬಂದ ಸರ್ ಯೂಟ್ಯೂಬ್ ಒಳಗೆ ಈಗ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಬರಾಗ ನನಗೂ ಈಗ ಸ್ಕ್ರೀನ್ ಶೇರ್ ಮಾಡಿ ನೋಡ್ರಿ ಸರ್ ನಿಮ್ ಅವ್ರದ್ದು ಸರ್ ಸ್ಕ್ರೀನ್ ಶೇರ್ ಮಾಡಿ ಸರಿ ಕೇಳೋಣ ಹಲೋ ಹಲೋ ಸರ್ ಸರ್ ಅದು ಸ್ಕ್ರೀನ್ ಶೇರಿಂಗ್ ಕ್ಲಿಕ್ ಮಾಡಿದ್ರ ಹೋಸ್ಟ್ ಡಿಸೇಬಲ್ಡ್ ಪಾರ್ಟಿಸಿಪೆಂಟ್ ಸ್ಕ್ರೀನಿಂಗ್ ಶೇರಿಂಗ್ ಮಾಡಿದ ಸೆಕ್ಯೂರಿಟಿಂಗ್ ರೂಮ್ ಲಾಕ್ ಮೀಟಿಂಗ್ ಶೇರ್ ಸ್ಕ್ರೀನ್ ಇನ್ನೇಮ ಶೇರ್ ಸ್ಕ್ರೀನ್ ಟಿಕ್ ಮಾರ್ಕ್ ಮಾಡ್ರಿ ಸರ್ ಅದನ್ನ ಸರ್ ಇವಾಗ ಟ್ರೈ ಮಾಡಿ ಈ ಟ್ರೈ ಮಾಡಿ ಸರ್ ಸರ್ ಸ್ಕ್ರೀನ್ ಶೇರ್ ಮಾಡಕ್ಕೆ ಟ್ರೈ ಮಾಡಿ ಸರ್ ಸರ್ ಚನು ಸರ್ ಚನು ಸರ್ ಫೋನ್ ಮಾಡ್ತೀನಿ ತಡಿ ಸರ್ ಸರಿ ಮಾಡ್ ಸರಿ ಕೇಳಕ ನೋಡ ಬಂದ 
ஹலோ ஹலோ சார் ஹலோ சார் கனகதம் சார் கனகதம் என்ன ஆ ஓகே சார் ஆ சார் சார் தி ஸ்கிரீன் இட் சார் இங்க மெயின் இதுக்கு கனகதம் ஆல்லே யூ லைக் யூடியூப் தான் நோட்ரே எஸ் சார் பன் சார் யூடியூப் தான் பன் சார் பன் தா ஆ சார் அதன யூடியூப் நம்ம ஷெட்யூல் ஹேங் கனெக்ட் பண்ண கூடாதுல நைட் ஆமா நோடா சார் யூடியூப் தாக ஸ்கிரீன் நிம்ம ஷேர் ஆகி சார் சார் தி ஆ சார் இங்க சார் பன் சார் ஹலோ <laughs> 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 சுச்சேத்த <laughs> Yes ma'am. Okay okay. Then uh, who are the other participants because here no I'm not able to see the names over here. Except for Sirisha other names I'm not able to see. User 1 somebody. Ah uh, some user 1 another one is uh, user 719. Ha? Huh? User 1 is sir madam. Okay okay fine fine. Namo 9 Suchetar. Hmm, yeah, now I can see the name, Suchet Vatkar. Shivani. அட்மிட்
सर यू स्टार्ट द क्लास सर इट्स फोर ओ क्लॉक हाँ सर एनी वे स्टूडेंट्स कैन ज्वाइन हेलो कैन यू माइस गाइस स्टूडेंट्स यस सर या so so today we will continue with our uh, module of physiology okay so last class we had studied about the nerve its properties and other things so now we will continue with the muscle okay so before going to the muscle there is a junction between the uh, neuron and the muscle fiber okay? okay so that is called as neuromuscular junction okay neuro since the previous lecture was not uploaded in youtube that uh, you please discuss with the med pj okay so chit i'll check it out and upload it fine okay sir okay right. okay fine so now we'll continue with the neuromuscular junction so it refers to the intimate contact of the nerve endings okay so the synaptic knobs okay nerve endings with the muscle fiber that innervates so to which they innervate so so the neuromuscular junction is there is a small gap okay there is a intimate contact of the nerve endings with the muscle fiber so it uh, it can measure about 20 to 30 nanometers so sometimes this numerical values have been asked several num number of times okay what is the size of the neuromuscular junction so it is in nanometers okay 20 to 30 nanometers you can see in the diagram so this is the axon so terminal so the nerve is ending as terminal buttons and it is making uh, contact with the muscle fiber so this is the terminal button which has got the stored neurotransmitters okay and it is making contact with the sarcolemma of the muscle fiber so this is the foldings so this junction is called as neuromuscular junction okay and you can see that in the diagram so your axon was covered by your myelin sheath so as it when it goes to innervate the <coughs> muscle fiber at the terminal it loses its myelin sheath so this is the naked ending okay that it doesn't have the myelin sheath okay there is another uh, feature that you can uh, note so this is the structure of the neuromuscular junction so sometimes the diagram based questions can come and they will project this is directly from your canal okay they may tell uh, identify the structure so this is the neuromuscular junction this is the terminal button the namings are uh, very uh, very much uh, visible here and it is containing the synaptic bicycles which are containing uh, which are which are containing acetylcholine here so which is the neurotransmitter acetylcholine and this is the presynaptic membrane so this is the presynaptic membrane okay and it is having calcium channels numerous calcium channels are present in the presynaptic membrane and this is the postsynaptic membrane of the muscle fiber or this is the muscle fiber okay sarcolemma so this is the post synaptic membrane and the gap in between these presynaptic and the post synaptic membrane this is the synaptic cleft so this is called as synaptic cleft where the neurotransmitters are released and coming and uh, binding with the receptors which are present on the post synaptic membrane okay and these are the junctional folds so this is a brief about the structure of the neuromuscular junction so we will see what are the events occurring at the neuromuscular junction okay so sequence of events so once this question was asked what are the sequence so they will give you the order in a four per per permutation combination events okay so you have to find out the which is the right sequence in the uh, events that are occurring in the uh, transmission of the signal that is at the neuromuscular junction so first is the release of the acetylcholine by the nerve terminals this is the first step so once the signal comes in the forms of uh, in the form of action potential the, the first step is there is the release of the neurotransmitter that is the acetyl colin okay the impulse which is arising in the end of the motor neuron okay neuron which is increases the permeable so once the impulse is arri arriving from the axon to the ter terminal so that impulse itself will increase the permeability of the calcium ions which are present in the presynaptic membrane okay that is the first step here and this calcium event okay which enters the and triggers the marked exocytosis of the acetylcholine containing vesicle so what is the role of this calcium which is entering here that is making or triggering the exocytosis of the vesicles so the vesicles are containing your neurotransmitter okay and now next step is now once the exocytosis of the acetylcholine occurs okay it has to come and bind with the receptors on the post synaptic membrane you can see in the diagram so so this is the pre synaptic membrane this is the post synaptic membrane once the neurotransmitters are released it comes at the acetylcholine the neurotransmitter is the ach acetylcholine comes and binds with the nicotinic type of acetylcholine receptors the type of so this is another question the type of receptors which are present on the muscle that is the muscle that is the nicotinic type of acetylcholine 
receptors which which are concentrated at the tops of the junctional folds of the membranes of the motor end plate that is the sarcolemma of the muscle fiber okay there are numerous uh, receptors that is nicotine so this is the term so another type of acetylcholine receptors that is the muscarinic okay that will come in the heart okay here in the muscle it is the nicotine so make uh, make the note of this point so this is the nicotinic type of acetylcholine receptors which are getting activated once the neurotransmitter that is acetylcholine is coming and binding with it okay so binding of acetylcholine to these receptors will increase the what are the events next so once the acetylcholine is binding with its receptor it activates the conductance of sodium and potassium ions on the post synaptic membrane okay so these are the this is the second event that is binding of the neurotransmitter to the receptor and that in turn increases the conductance of sodium and potassium ions next what happens once there is a conductance of sodium and potassium ions so it results in the influx of sodium ions okay so once the sodium ion is coming into the muscle fiber into the cytoplasm it is causing a depolarizing potential since it is a positively charged ion sodium okay so there is development of a depolarizing potential that we call it as end plate potential the potential which is developed due to the increase in the conductance of sodium and potassium the potential that is depolarizing potential which is uh, uh, resulted is the end plate potential end plate potential so this end plate potential is non propagative so this is another question that is, has been asked a number of times so this end plate potential is non propagative it cannot transmit throughout the muscle okay muscle fiber it is localized non propagative okay the average human in, in humans in an average human the end plate that contains about 15 to 40 millions of acetylcholine receptors so what are the number of uh, acetylcholine receptors in humans roughly around 15 to 40 million acetylcholine receptors and each nerve impulse releases 60 acetylcholine vesicles one nerve impulse one action potential in the nerve will release 60 acetylcholine vesicle and each vesicle again contains 10000 molecules of the neurotransmitters so you can you can now just multiply the things here and you can see how many times the how what is the quantity of the acetylcholine that has been released with the one single impulse and that will immediately cause the uh, contraction of your muscles okay muscle fibers so that's how the uh, there is a rapid rapid <clears throat> increase in the uh, transmission of the action potential so remember that the third step is development of the end plate potential which is non propagative so this is the third sequence of the events okay next coming so you can see here so in the graph so this graph has been asked n number of times they'll give you this and identify what is a so over here a is nothing but the end plate potential initially whenever there is a release of acetylcholine first there is the uh, development of the depolarizing type of the action potential here so that is the end plate potential which is non propagative once this is sorry once this is reaching the threshold then there is production of the action potential in the muscle fiber okay so it has to release more when the more and more acetylcholine comes and binds with the receptors then it will reach the threshold and there is production of the action potential in the muscle fiber which will result in the mechanical event that is the contraction of the muscle fiber so this is the electrical events occurring in the muscle fiber here okay first is the electrical event followed by the mechanical event okay and you can see here one more c the small depolarizing potential you can see c where a is little bit more okay this is full that is action potential and then we can see that one more c okay so this is nothing but the miniature end plate potential so there is a difference between these terminology so this the terminology itself can be asked as a potential questions for you so coming to this c just remember that it is a small deflection okay not as big as your end plate uh, end plate potential so what is this c that is called as miniature end plate potential okay so at rest okay we uh, your normal human beings at rest small quanta or the packets of acetylcholine are released randomly by the nerve cell membranes even at rest some quantity some quanta of the acetylcholines are continuously released and this produces a minute very little depolarizing spike type of potential okay you saw in the last diagram so that is called as miniature end plate potential which is about 0.5 millivolt in amplitude so don't confuse with the end plate potential
potential and miniature end plate. So miniature end plate potential is even present at rest because of this small quanta of acetylcholine are released randomly. Okay, the size of the quanta of the acetylcholine released in the way varies directly with the calcium concentration. So more calcium means more packets or more quanta will be released like that. Next coming to the next sequence of event. So once the acetylcholine binds with the receptor. Once it produces the action potential in the muscle fiber, okay, its action is over. Now it has to be cleared from the your neuromuscular junction, that side, okay. The acetylcholine then is removed within one millisecond. Immediately in the climate, uh, synaptic cleft, it has been removed. How? By the enzyme called as acetylcholine esterase, okay. So the synaptic cleft contains numerous enzymes with are present even very high concentration, okay. That is the acetylcholine Yesterday's. So there is the rapid removal of the acetylcholine, which will prevent the repeated excitation of the muscle fiber. So suppose if there was no acetylcholine esterase, what would have happened? This acetylcholine would have again gone and bound to the receptor and there could be repeated excitation. So the muscle could have gone for the complete contra contra continued contraction uh, resulting in rigor. Okay. So that's how it is prevented by the removal. Now you should remember all those sequence of events once this question was asked already. Now coming to the applied aspects here, the disease that is uh, mainly present in the, with respect to the NMJ, that is neuromuscular junction is the myasthenia gravis. So you're uh, well aware of this. So myasthenia gravis is a serious and sometimes can be fatal. So where the skeletal muscles are weak and they will tire very easily. So the muscles will get easily fatigued, okay? So it is caused by the formation of autoantibodies. Remember, it is the autoantibodies to the muscle type of nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. The main pathology in the myasthenia is the production of the circulating the circulation of the autoantibodies against the nicotinic type of acetylcholine receptors. So these antibodies will destroy some of the receptors and some of them will block the block the action of the acetylcholine directly. Okay. And they bind to the other neighboring receptors also, triggering their removal by endocytosis. So if this autoantibodies come and attack, there will be endocytosis of the receptors. Hence, what happens? The number of receptors will go on decreasing. Okay. This is the reason why there is a development of the reason for this disease is the autoimmunity. Okay. It is an autoimmune disease where for, uh, autoimmune disease for the acetylcholine receptors. Okay. Still, the uh, 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 exact cause is unknown, but it is an autoimmune disease. Okay. The end plate potentials that occur in the muscle fibers are mostly too weak to initiate the opening of the voltage gated sodium channels here. Okay. Therefore, there will not be any depolarization of the muscle fiber as the muscle cannot contract and there will be easy fatigability. Okay. If the disease is intense enough, the patient can die due to paralysis of the respiratory muscle. So if the respiratory muscles are involved here, then the person can immediately go for the uh, death. Okay. That is the very uh, fatal. Okay. So the disease can usually be ameliorated by several hours by administrating the neostigmine. Okay. That is the anticholine SRS drugs. Okay. Which allows the large number of acetylcholine to be accumulated at the synaptic space. Okay. What happens? This drug will block the enzyme which is destroying the acetylcholine. So indirectly what happens? You are going to increase the number of acetylcholine in the synaptic space space so that whatever the number of receptors available now, so they will be activated and there will be some muscle action. Oh, so, okay. So neostigmine, what is the function of the neostigmine? It inactivates the acetylcholine esterase enzyme which is present in the synapse. Okay. So that there can be some response in the person suffering from myasthenia. Okay. Another disease usually associated with this uh, uh, NMJ is the Lambert-Eaton syndrome. Okay. So the slight difference here is the it is he, it is also an autoimmune disease. Here, muscle weakness is mainly produced by the antibodies which are against the calcium channels which are present in the presynaptic membrane. Remember, the pathology is different here. Here, the auto antibodies, okay, which are uh, attacking the calcium channels which are present in the nerve endings. That is the presynaptic membrane. So, what happens again? So, there is a decrease in the calcium influx that will cause decrease in the vesicles which are secreting the acetylcholine. That is the decreased exocytosis of the acetylcholine. Okay. However, the muscle strength can be increased with prolonged contraction as more and more calcium is released. So, if you go on, if the person suffering from Eaton Lambert syndrome, if you make him to perform more and more, okay, so the strength of the contraction will go on. That is the difference between myasthenia and the Lambert Eaton. So what happens in case of myasthenia, if you go on repeatedly stimulate the muscle fiber there, the neuron there, there will be decremental response. Whereas in case of Lambert, you get an incremental response in case of Lambert-Eaton 
syndrome okay now coming to some of the drugs that stimulate the muscle fiber by acetylcholine like action so methacholine carbacol and nicotine so these have got same effect that are on the muscle fiber as the acetylcholine so if you give to, uh, to the, uh, these patients uh, these drugs uh, some incremental response you can expect okay that will stimulate the uh, muscle by acetylcholine like action then some there are some drugs which work by causing the localized area of the depolarization of the muscle fibers okay so these uh, indirectly work by Uh, mimicking the acetylcholine and there is production of the motor end plate okay at the motor end plate these drugs are acting where acetylcholine receptors are located now coming to some of the drugs that block the neuromuscular junction so sometimes this can be asked so drugs that are blocking the nmj okay a group of drugs known as curariform drugs okay can prevent the passage of impulses by blocking the transmission of the impulse at the neuromuscular junction okay for instance d tubocurarin okay this blocks the action of the acetylcholine on the muscle fiber that is the uh, receptors thus preventing the sufficient increase in the permeability of this ions across the uh, muscle membrane so d tubocurarin that will block the acetylcholine action of the acetylcholine in, at the receptor level itself so this is the one drug which will block the transmission of the impulse okay so coming to the now once this information is now passing on to the skeletal muscle fibers okay now what is happening in the skeletal muscle okay now coming to the next structure so we saw neuron now next was the neuromuscular junction and next we are going to the skeletal muscle proper okay skeletal muscle proper so uh, should know in detail because some of the questions have been asked from this very basic uh, questions have been asked okay the skeletal muscles <coughs> second guys skeletal muscles is made up of individual muscle fibers which are the building blocks of the muscular system okay now most of the skeletal muscles begin and end in tendons okay tendons at the both the ends you know that okay anatomy part okay the muscle fibers are arranged parallel in between these tendinous ends and each muscle fiber is a single cell maybe 1 to 4 cm in length which is cylindrical okay multi nucleated it is very long cylindric and surrounded by a cell membrane here the cell membrane we call it as sarcolemma we call it as sarco lemma the muscle fiber are made up of, of so again this muscle in individual muscle fibers are made up of myofibrils which are divisible into individual filaments and these filaments are made up of contractile proteins okay contractile so now we will see all these things in detail okay so you can see it is the tendinous end this is the long cylindrical muscle okay which is having muscle fibers sarcolemma okay we'll come to this again in detail okay this is step by step so ultimately you have got the sarcomere here okay we will see what is the structure of the sarcomere so this is the sarcomere okay so this question has been asked n number of times what is the length of the one sarcomere so remember 2.5 micrometers it is the distance between the two z lines okay so if you take the this is the electron picture of the sarcomere okay so you can see that there is a i band there is a a band okay isotropic for i okay where the polarized light can easily pass through this part of the muscle fiber another is the anisotropic okay there is the light cannot uh, pass through this okay so it is called as a band so you can see that the z line is in the center of the i band okay z line is in the center there is a small dark portion of in the center of the i band that is called as z line and the distance between two consecutive z lines is the length of the sarcomere and you can see in the anisotropic band that is a band in the center there is a small light portion that we call it as m line okay m line so these are the nomenclature that is the, you should remember so sometimes they can ask, uh, by giving the picture what is this band a band i band something like that they can form a permutation come questions can come here okay now coming to the same thing okay this is the sarcomere in the relaxed state and this is the in the contracted state you can see that the z lines are approaching or approximating during the contraction phase okay contraction phase and this is the sarcomere this was the central a band okay this was the z line you can see that thick filament is here and the thin filament is here which is attached to the z line okay the thin filaments are attached to the z line and the thick filaments are in the center and these thick filaments are the one which are pulling the z line towards uh, them okay during the contraction so when when, the, when there is a contraction this z lines approximate each other so now see we will say again in detail so again this is the same sarcomere diagram okay a band so what is a band this is a dark band containing thick myosin filaments so what are the contents in the a band there are nothing but the thick myosin filaments 
roughly about 1.5 micrometers in length okay in the center of the a band as i told there is a small lighter h zone okay where the thin filaments do not overlap okay there they don't overlap there is a lighter h zone in the center of the a band so this is the a band mainly containing thick myosin filaments okay and in the center of the h zone there is a m line which is prominent during the muscle contraction at the center of this h zone again there is a prominent m line okay which is seen during the muscle contraction then coming to the i band which is 1 micrometers in length which mainly contains only the thin filaments which contain only the thin filaments each i band is bisected by a narrow z line as i told in this diagram so in this i band so there is a small bisected okay which is having little bit thicker in uh, color okay concentration that is na narrow z line okay so the portion of the myofibril between the two successive z lines is called as sarcomere so this is the definition for your sarcomere the portion of the myofibril between two successive z line we call it as sarcomere what is the uh, length can you tell now what is the length of the sarcomere it is asked many times now tell me what point is five mile. My, micrometers so don't confuse with the unit so many times there will be two options with 2.5 one can be a nanometer one can be a micrometer like that so please remember the it is micrometers okay in micrometers okay sarcomere are you following guys have you understood till now yes sir yes sir ah, so there is a difference in the refractive index of the various parts of the muscle fiber that is responsible for this cross striations which you saw okay the parts of the cross striations that are identified by the letters that is the i band and the a band okay this already we have discussed okay? this is just the theory part okay the transverse m line in the middle of the h i as i told it is more prominent during the contraction phase and the area between two adjacent z lines is called as the sarcomere the orderly arrangement of this actin myosin okay and related produce a pattern okay so because this all okay sarcomere this is because of the there is a regular arrangement of the proteins that is the actin myosin and the other related proteins now coming to the myofibril again they are arranged parallel so there are n number of myofibrils in a muscle okay they are arranged parallel to each other so 1 to 2 micrometers in diameter so this is regarding the my, my, myofibrils okay 1 to 2 micrometers in diameter 1 to 4 centimeters in length which will contain thick thin filaments and other related proteins okay the contractile mechanism in the skeletal muscle depends mainly upon okay myosin 2 okay these are the proteins myosin 2 actin tropomyosin and troponin okay and troponin again we have troponin i troponin t and troponin c so now we will see all these things in detail again one by one okay also remember there are some additional structural proteins that are important in this skeletal muscle function okay they are actinin titin and desmin okay so there is a desmin you just remember in the coming slide i will sh uh, show something regarding this okay so these are the various contractile proteins myosin 2 actin tropomyosin troponin again troponin we have three varieties troponin i troponin t troponin c and there are some additional structural proteins actin in titin and desmin okay so this is the structure some sometimes this uh, uh, can be given as a diagram and uh, we can be asked what is this so this is the a diagram of the myosin 2 contractile protein so you can see there is a globular head and a tail okay which is the tail is roughly 100 nanometers in length okay and in the head you can see that there is a actin binding site and there is the myosin atpas site where the atp is broken down okay energy is required for the contraction okay so in the myosin head 2 so there are two sites actin binding site and atpas binding site okay atpas site Right. so this is how these these are arranged parallelly in the muscle fibers okay this is the myosin 2 okay so same thing the form of the myosin that is found in the muscle is myosin type 2 so with the two globular heads and a long tail the head of the myosin contains as i told form the cross links with to the actin okay this head which is binding with the actin to produce the contraction and the myosin contains heavy chains and light chains okay the light chains combine with the amino a uh, terminal portions of the heavy chains to form the globular head okay globular head and these heads contain two sites as i already told one is the actin binding site and other is the site for catalytic site for the atp that is atps site okay atps site and each thick segment contains several hundred myosin molecules several hundred myosin molecules now coming to the next actin you can see here these are the actin molecules each actin molecule is having a one site that is binding site for the myosin 2 head so in the myosin 2 head there was a site for binding actin 
the same way in the actin there is a binding site for the myosin so this is the thing so these actin molecules they are arranged in a rope like like a rope you can see one, one by one okay they, they form a helix okay this is the actin helix okay and to this actin helix you can see this is the tropomyosin which is wound around okay wound around okay at a regular intervals you can see the troponin these three molecules troponin i t and troponin c so these you can see at a regular intervals they are bound to the actin molecule tropomyosin where they are uh, crossing over you can see that the tropomyosin is very beautifully you can see that this tropomyosin is, uh, is wound in such a way that it is covering the myosin binding site which is present on the actin so you can see this is the binding site for the myosin one 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 you can see this green points okay along this covering this, this uh, spots only your tropomyosin is running beautifully okay at and at regular intervals your troponin molecules or proteins are there okay now we will see what is the importance of that so the thin filaments of this they are, they, they are, these are nothing but the polymers which are made up of two chains of actin forming a long double helix and tropomyosin molecule is a long filament that is located in the groove between the these two chains so in this between the groove between the uh, this uh, double helix uh, long helix formed by the actin molecules is your tropomyosin molecule so each thin filament contains about 300 to 400 actin molecules and 40 to 60 tropomyosin molecules okay each filament is containing 300 to 400 actin molecules and 40 to 60 tropomyosin molecules this trop and this troponin molecules okay uh, troponin i troponin t troponin c so these are the small globular units located at regular intervals along the tropomyosin molecules okay and troponin t binds the other troponin components to tropomyosin so this is tropo the, the, this troponin t okay this is the one which is helping in binding to the tropomyosin there okay and troponin i inhibits the interaction of the myosin with the actin so myosin and actin have got a binding site for each other so that is covered here okay the binding site of the for myosin which is present on the actin that is covered by your troponin i i for inhibits i okay that is how it is this one troponin t means it is the one which is binding with the tropomyosin okay and there is one more troponin c so that is containing a binding site for the calcium, which is very important for the contraction process. Okay. So this is how it is structurally arranged. Okay. Now coming to the one more concept that is the sarcotubular system. Okay. Sarcotubular system. So the muscle fibers are surrounded by structures that are made up of membrane that appear like in the electron micrographs. Okay. As vesicles and tubules. And these structures, they are, they are called as the sarcotubular system system okay which is made up of a t type of system okay which is having the sarcoplasmic reticulum okay this t system and there is a sarcoplasmic reticulum so together they form a sarcotubular system this t system is nothing but okay the t system of this transverse tubules which are continuous with the membrane of the muscle fibers they form a grid okay perforated by individual muscle fibers so i will show in the diagram how actually this t system look okay and the space between these two layers of the T system is the extension of the extracellular space. Okay, extracellular. So this is just just imaginated like this. Okay, I'll show in the diagram. So the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which forms an irregular, which contains, which curtain around the myofibrils, has enlarged T terminals. Okay, T systems in close contact with the T system. So if you see this diagram, you can see. So this is the T system. So this is the T system. It is nothing but the imagination of the earth, which contains the ECF environment only. Okay, ECF environment. So this is the transverse T system. Okay, this is the T tubule. Okay, and on either side in the muscle, you have got the. This is what is this? This is the terminal end of the sarcotubular system. Okay, sarcotubule. This is the which is the one which is continuous with the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, we'll come to that again. Okay, so you can see in one more diagram. So this is the transverse T table, which is connected with the terminal systems. Okay, terminal systems. Okay. At these points of contact, the arrangement of the T system with the cistern of the sarcoplasmic reticulum on either side together, they make the triad. So what is the triad here? You can see here. So this is the triad. Okay, this is the T system and this is the sarcoplasmic reticulum terminal end of so together one two three so this is the triad okay this is the triad so this is very important now we'll come to why this is important a sarcotubular system okay so you can see in this diagram again 
so yeah i have taken a highlighted point here so you have got some receptors here and there are some receptors on the t tubule so t tubule you can see in the center the pink color one this is the t tubule okay having a receptor called as dry hydropyridine receptors okay dry hydro pyridine receptors and there are some receptors which are present on the terminal system of the sarcoplasmic reticulum so that is called as ranodin receptor can you see guys the wordings ranodin receptor here yes sir yeah so this is the ranodin receptors which are present on the sister net that is the terminal sac of the sarcoplasmic reticulum okay and the receptors which are present in the t system they are the dihydropyridine receptors okay but dihydropyridine receptors okay see the function of the t system is is continuous with the sarcolemma okay the first thing is the t system okay the what was the, the imagination that is continuous with the sarcolemma so this is because for the rapid transmission of the action potential from the cell membrane to all the myofibrils okay all the fibrils which are there in the muscle the sarcoplasmic reticulum is one which is rich in calcium okay that is the the sarcoplasmic reticulum in the muscle fiber is the one where where the more concentration of calcium is been stored here okay which is stored okay calcium is stored so now coming to the one minute guys so this is regarding the, now are you clear with the diagram guys sarco tubular system is it clear the triad is it okay yeah. have understood this sarco tubular system okay next coming to the dystrophin glycoprotein complex so dystrophin so there is a large dystrophin protein that forms a rod that connects the thin actin filaments to the transmembrane proteins that is the beta dystroglycan okay in the sarcolemma or by smaller proteins in the cytoplasm called as syntrophins okay the cytoplasm contains syntrophins okay this dystrophin is a again it is a protein okay that is connecting the beta uh, dystroglycan with the syntrophins okay this beta dystroglycan is connected to the myrosin what is this myrosin is refers to the laminins that are contain the alpha 2 subunit of the trimeric makeup okay in the extracellular matrix of the alpha dextroglycan so you can see in the diagram regarding this complex okay the dystro uh, the dystroglycans are the in turn are associated with the complex of four transmembrane proteins alpha beta gamma and delta okay and this together they form a complex okay they add strength to the muscle by providing the scaffolding uh, scaffolding okay for the fibrils and connecting them to the extracellular so what is the main function of this uh, various proteins uh, which is making a complex is to add strength to the muscle by providing this scaffold uh, scaffolding for the fibrils and connecting them to the extracellular environment you can see the diagram here sometimes this diagram can be given and identify the structure you can see okay dystrophin uh, alpha and beta this beta is connected to the internal small proteins okay syntrophins and this complex is having uh, alpha beta gamma and delta this is a complex together okay small proteins which are present in the transmembrane okay and together they form the uh complex okay dystro i want to show dystrophin glycoprotein complex so what is the importance of this so there are some diseases where this protein is absent if this complex okay dystrophin protein is if it is absent then we can have a serious form of dystrophy that we call as a duquenne muscular dystrophy okay duquenne muscular dystrophy is because of the absence of the dystrophin protein complex okay it is a x linked okay it is x linked and usually fatal by the age of 30 okay and in the milder form of the disease the same okay if the, there is, if there is a dystrophin is present but it is altered or reduced in amount then we can expect a similar type of dystrophy but we call it as beckers a uh, muscular dystrophy okay because if this com this complex okay this dystrophin protein if it is completely absent then the disease is called as duquenne muscular dystrophy if it is altered or reduced in amount then it is called as beckers muscular dystrophy okay and earlier uh, slide i have told there are some related proteins like desmin okay related myopathy is also very rare but there are heterogeneous group of muscle disorders that typically result in cellular aggregates of the desmin inside the muscle fiber okay common symptoms of these are swelling and wasting in the distal muscles okay mainly the distal limb muscles are affected mainly of the lower limbs okay that can be 
identified in other body areas also so these are the some of the common last question okay Duchenne muscular dystrophy, complete absence of the dystrophin protein complex or the protein. Okay, it is X-linked, and the milder form where there is a reduced amount of the uh, dystrophin protein that we call it as Becker's muscular dystrophy. And there is one more that is desmin-related myopathies are also possible. Okay, next coming to the molecular basis of contraction. Now coming to the next step. Okay, molecular. So now you saw the sarcotubular system, the arrangement of the various proteins. Now we will see how exactly the Molecular basis of the contraction is occurring. The process by which the shortening of the contractile elements in the muscle is brought about by a sliding of the thin filaments over the thick filaments. Okay, there is sliding of the thin filaments over the thick filaments that is resulting in the uh, contraction. So the width of the A bands is constant, whereas the Z lines are moving closer to each other. So during contraction, what, what I told the Z lines are approximating each other. So the Z lines move closer to each other when the muscle is contracts. Okay. So this is the how okay the sliding filament theory explains okay now we will see the sequence of events. So once the muscle is uh, as you know the muscle is a excitable tissue okay stimulated by the action potential which is produced it is the electrical phenomena so because it is stimulated by the action potential which is coming in the neuron. So now first is the electrical event next is the uh, uh, mechanical event that is the contraction of the muscle fiber. The muscle fiber responds to the stimulus by contracting. So the events which link the electrical phenomenon with the mechanical phenomena, we call it as excitation contraction coupling. Okay. So sometimes this can be asked. Once it was asked, so whether the electrical phenomena is occurring first or the mechanical phenomena. So always remember that first it is always the electrical phenomena even in the heart okay even in the myo, uh, myocardium also the same thing first is the electrical phenomenon then followed by the mechanical events that is the contraction of the muscle so recently this question was asked actually in the dnb okay so this is the call this is called as excitation contraction coupling okay these three phenomena which link mark the excitability and contractility of the muscle fibers when they are stimulated. Now coming to the process, what actually is happening, okay, coming to the process. So once this question was asked, the sequence of events again was asked once, now we should know the events uh, in a step-by-step -step manner. So they can give you uh, various uh, sequences and ask, find the correct one, okay, find the correct one, okay. When action potential, so when the action potential reaches the tip of the T tubule, so now you saw that transverse T tubule. So once the action potential reaches the tip of the T-tubule, it activates the voltage-gated channels, okay, which uh, now you, uh, I, I already showed in the previous diagram. On the T-tubules, which were the receptors? DHP. What is DHP? Dryhydropyridine receptors, okay, they are present on the T-tubules, okay. Once the act action potential reaches here, okay, one, once the action potential reaches here, it will activate the voltage-gated dryhydropyridine receptors. The activated dryhydropyridine receptors in turn trigger the opening of the that is the calcium release from the terminal cistern of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. What, what were the receptors they were present there? Can you tell me now? Anyone can tell? What were the receptors? Ranodine. Yes, it was the ranodin receptors. Okay, it was the ranodin receptors which are present on the terminal cisterns. Okay, so this is the sequence. First, action potential reaches, activates the voltage-gated channels of the dry hydrocodone receptors present on the T-table. Then that in turn activates the ranodine receptors. Once this ranodine receptors are activated, then there is release of the calcium because the calcium is very much stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay, stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So first, so finally what is happening? The ranodine receptors are getting activated and then there is the release of calcium. So this is possible because the lateral systems are located very close. So these are very closely uh, uh, located. So this is how it is. They are interlocked. Both these dry hydroprene receptors and the ranodin receptors are mechanically interlocked. So if this is activated, automatically it will activate the ranodin receptor. Okay, like that. So thus, when the dry hydroprene receptor is activated by the depolarization of the t tubules it undergoes conformational change. So be, since they are interlocked, once the action pot potential comes, they undergo a con confirm, uh, confront, uh, con conformational changes, which will result in the opening up of the ranodine receptor. You can see here. So this is in the resting state. Okay. Once the action potential comes in the T table, it will activate the dry hydro uh, uh, DHP, that is dihydroprotein receptors here. Once this is activated, 
that will activate the ranodine receptors at rest they are interlocked here you can see the interlocking once this is activated you can see it is pulling the ranodine receptors away from the terminal system once this is pulled away there is opening up of the calcium ions uh, the calcium channels in the terminal system of the sarcoplasmic reticulum once this is pulled away the calcium automatically comes outside and it will go to the cytoplasm have you understood this guys understood the sequence of events yes sir so this has been asked once so please remember action potential is coming activating the dihydropyrin receptors in turn it will activate the ranodine receptors and it pulls away because they are interlocked when it is pulled away the calcium will come out and this calcium is the one which is very important for the contraction of the contractile mechanism that we will go we are, we are going to see in the next slides okay now coming to the basis of contraction now once this calcium is released what is happening that is explained by a theory called as sliding theory or the ratchet theory once this question was asked what so the molecular basis of contraction is explained by what theory so ratchet theory or the sliding phenomenon okay sliding theory so what are they again the steps will they again uh, they will ask in sequence what are the sequence of events so first is the initiation of the cross bridge cycling okay during this stage what happens the troponin i okay troponin now remember all those proteins which i had told now what is happening troponin i is bound to the actin and the tropomyosin molecules are located in the groove between those strands of the actin molecules in such a way that they block the myosin binding sites on the actin so troponin i is in such a way beautifully it is placed there is no interaction between the myosin and the actin okay so when there is when the activation takes place that is the calcium now which is released okay now the calcium which is released that is getting attached to the troponin c when the calcium attaches with the troponin c there is the activation of the whole contractile mechanism here it results again in the conformational change okay which causes the tropomyosin molecules to move laterally now earlier you saw that beautifully it was covering the myosin binding sites on the actin molecules now once the calcium uh, attaches to the attaches to the uh, uh, troponin c it uh, the tropomyosin moves laterally and it will uncover the binding site of the actin molecules for the head of the myosin now what happens when the calcium binds tropomyosin moves laterally and the binding site is exposed binding site is exposed now you can see here so this was beautifully the tropomyosin was along the binding site on the actin molecules okay when the calcium came and attached to troponin c that will move laterally and expose now you can see here once the calcium comes and attaches here there is a lateral movement of this tropomyosin what happens now the myosin binding site is exposed when it is exposed the myosin head will come immediately and bind to it okay it will bind to it okay that will bind to it okay now what happens once it is bound there is a formation of actin and myosin complex the attachment of myosin head to the active sites of the actin filament the head of the myosin molecule binds with the ATP. So, uh, simultaneously what is happening the atp is bound to the binding site there is a atps activity there is a breaking of the atp to the high energy phosphates okay that will remain bound to the myosin head the head of the myosin therefore becomes energized once there is formation of this complex there is immediate release of the high energy and the myosin head will become energized okay it will become energized the activated myosin head now is perpendicular that is 90 degree towards the actin filament that is getting attached now what happens the next step is once the myosin head is energized with the high uh, uh, phosphate bonds there is a formation of the actin myosin adp pi complex that triggers the release of your high energy phosphates and adp from the complex okay and there is a conformational change in the myosin head causing flexion towards the arm of the cross bridge so initially it was in perpendicular 90 degree attachment so once this is released the high energy phosphate is released from the complex there what happens that 90 degree becomes 45 degree so it will pull pull towards the <coughs> towards itself okay so causing the flexion of the myosin head that is called as power stroke that is called as power stroke okay that is called as power stroke okay now you can see here so initially it was not bound and once the calcium is released the myosin head is binding to the actin okay 
and there is the release of the high energy phosphates which will cause the bending so this is the power stroke you can see it was straight here it was almost 90 degree now there was it, uh, the angle became 45 degree so this process is called as power stroke now what, now what happens once there is a power stroke there is actual contraction of the muscle okay during the power stroke it is the actual contraction of the muscle once the contraction is over then there is a detachment of the myosin head okay of the cross bridge to form the active site of the actin actin filament what is happening now again the release of adp and allows the fresh atp to come and bind with the myosin head now after the contraction is over what is happening atp will come and bind with the myosin head okay thus myosin atp complex which so this myosin atp complex has low affinity for the actin only when it is broken atp is broken adp to api only that is very much attractive to the binding to the actin so once the contraction is over the atp again comes and uh, locates onto the myosin head and this myosin atp complex has low affinity for the actin which will result in the dissociation of the myosin head from the actin filament thus there is a relaxation thus there is relaxation okay so this is the detachment okay so for detachment what is required guys tell me so this is very very important concept to understand the next one more theory so for the relaxation what you require please answer what molecule you require for the relaxation that is the release of the myosin from the actin what is this atp yes atp so remember only if there is atp in our body only then the muscle will relax suppose there is no atp now what will happen tell me suppose the, the body doesn't have atp does the myosin head detach from the actin molecule no it cannot okay that will result in a state called as rigor mortis mortis yes rigor mortis okay that uh, uh, so that we will see okay now coming to the reactivation of the myosin head so this now the freshly bound atp molecules again splits again okay myosin head uh, to to get reactivated to the next cycle to begin so for the next contraction to it will get ready okay the anesthetized head extends again perpendicular to the actin filaments gets ready for the next contraction okay so this is how so first it is in the relaxed then it will attach then there is a power stroke you can see the 90 degree becomes 45 degree here this is flexion this is the power stroke now again atp molecule will come and bind and there is relaxation and this cycle goes on continue have you understood the steps guys so once this has been asked okay, okay. hope you have followed it okay now come so the same thing okay steps okay so what i told within few milliseconds of the action potential there is release of calcium ions from the sarco uh, into the sarcoplasm okay which will uh, result in the contraction okay the removal of the now what happens once the contraction process is over the calcium is again pumped back to the sarcoplasmic reticulum okay removal of calcium from the troponin restores the blocking of the action of the for forming the complex that is troponin tropomyosin complex the myosin cross bridge cycle closes and the muscle will relax okay muscle will so this is the sliding filament theory the same thing okay binding power stroke and detachment and again binding so this will go on <laughs> repeating again and again as long as the action potentials are coming from the neuron okay so this is the sliding filament theory so these are the sequence of so this is given in your ganon okay once there is a question based on the same headings okay they have given the sequence of events according to this uh, table and they have asked which one is correct okay so now from the first okay the first step is discharge from the motor neuron once there is a discharge action potential in the motor neuron then there is release of the neurotransmitters at the motor end plate next is the binding of acetylcholine to the nicotinic type of acetylcholine receptors on the post synaptic membrane that is the sarcolemma so that will lead to the increased conductance of ions sodium and potassium and there is generation of the end plate potential once the end plate potential is uh, accumulated and reaches a threshold then there is the really, uh, then there is the generation of the action potential in the muscle fiber and once this action potential comes into the t system t t will then there is activation of the dihydropyridine receptors that will in turn lead to the activation of the ranodin receptors and there is release of calcium from the terminal systems of the systems of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and diffuses okay and this calcium will bind with the troponin c 
once the troponin cis bond there is uncovering of the myosin and binding sites on the actin actin then there is formation of the cross linkages which will cause the contraction of the muscle fiber okay have you understood the sequence guys understood yes sir ah yeah so the same question is asked because this table is from ganong okay this table is from ganong okay same question as so steps in relaxation what happens in relaxation calcium is pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum okay so then again there is release of calcium from the troponin troponin okay from the troponin see the calcium is removed and there is uh, cessation of the interaction between the actin and myosin actin and myosin now coming to the important concept again i told that is the rigor mortis to muscle to relax what you require atp whenever there is atp then only there is relaxation of the uh, or the detachment of the myosin head from the actin so when muscle fibers are completely depleted of atp on phosphoryl creatine they develop a state called as rigor they develop a state called as rigor that is called as rigor mortis okay when this occurs this usually occurs after death therefore this is called as rigor mortis so in rigor what happens almost all the myosin heads get attached to the actin but it is in abnormal fixed and resistant way so they are fixed in a abnormally fixed and resistant way okay it usually begins 3 to 4 hours after the death and completes by 12 to 13 hours so this is rigor mortis is because of the complete absence of atp in the dead body that is after death there is no available of atp since there is no availability of atp the muscle cannot relax therefore the muscle is always in a contracted state that is abnormal fixed and in resistant way okay resistant way so this is called as rigor mortis begins 3 to 4 hours after the death and completes by about 12 to 13 hours and regarding the details of this you will learn in the forensic okay have you understood the uh, physiological basis for the rigor mortis understood yes, sir. yeah so this is very important okay yes, next coming to so this is the same slide types of contraction okay types of contraction so the muscular contraction involves shortening of the contractile elements but because the muscle have got elastic and viscous elements in a series with a contractile mechanism it is possible for the contraction to occur without appreciable decrease in the length now what happens is whenever the uh, there is a uh, action potential that is coming so there can be a decrease in the length or not depending upon the type of the contraction suppose if there is no much appreciable decrease in the length of the muscle fiber such type of contraction of the muscles we call it as isometric okay iso means same metric means length okay iso same length okay that is called as isometric contraction isometric contraction okay and sometimes there is contraction of the muscle fibers against a constant load with a decrease in the muscle length okay decrease so uh, sorry in the isometric there is no much decrease in the muscle length but in case of isotonic the muscles are contracting against a constant load but with a decrease in the muscle length isotonic tone is same but the muscle length is decreasing that is called as isotonic in case of isometric iso means same metric the muscle length remains the same but there is contraction but there is contraction that is called as isometric so one 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 example i will give you in case of isometric so the muscle length should be same so what what could be the best example if you are going to push a wall okay there is a tension okay that is a tension that is developed in the muscle whenever you are pushing a wall your biceps triceps will contract but the muscle length is not changing there okay that is the example for isometric what are the which is the best example for isotonic here isotonic means tone is constant but there is decrease in the muscle fiber so whenever you are lifting a bucket of water or a something you are some load something you are picking up okay there is a contraction of the muscle fibers against a constant load so constantly you are lifting the bucket okay so there is contraction of the muscle fiber but there is decrease in the muscle length that is in the decrease in the muscle length okay that is the decrease in the muscle length so that is called as isotonic so what happens here is note that work is done what is the work work is the product of force times the distance force times the distance okay now distance means here the length of the muscle fiber 
so in case of uh, isotonic uh, the uh, muscle length decreased or uh, uh, in case of isometric it decreased tell me so in case of isotonic there was decrease in the muscle length there was decrease in the muscle length therefore in case of isotonic contractions there is some work is done because work done is given by a product of force into distance okay in case of isometric contractions so there is no work is done even though there is contraction in the muscle fiber there is no work is done okay so this has been asked n number of times in your entrance exams okay so remember that in isotonic since there is change in the muscle length okay change in the muscle length okay so there is work is done in case of isometric since the muscle length has not changed there is no work done so this has been asked n number of times okay because work done is given by product of force into distance because distance it is changing only in case of isotonic therefore in isotonic work is done okay have you understood that did you understand guys yes sir so uh... remember, remember these are very small typical questions but you will tend to if you don't know i, I have no, don't understand the basics you will easily lose that one mark okay just remember such concepts okay and revise okay now coming to the muscle twitch coming to the muscle twitch what is muscle twitch so a single action potential causes a brief contraction followed by relaxation so together we call it as a simple muscle twitch simple muscle twitch you can see in this diagram here so this is the diagram for a Uh, the the response which we call it as a twitch okay simple twitch so the twitch starts about 2 milliseconds after the start of the membrane depolarization and before the repolarization is complete you can see this is the first is the electrical event so whenever there is action potential that is reaching the sarcolemma so there is a electrical event first which is followed by the mechanical so this uh, second one is the mechanical event okay this is the mechanical event this is the electrical event so electrical event first mechanical event this is the contraction so so this together we we the constitute the simple muscle twitch okay muscle twitch so now there are various types of fibers so this twitch okay can vary the response can vary the fast muscle fibers primarily those concerned with the fine rapid and precise movement like the muscles of the fingertips okay they have got twitch duration about as short as 7.5 milliseconds within 7.5 milliseconds there is contraction and relaxation both electrical event as well as mechanical event so those muscle fibers are called as fast muscle fibers because they are mainly involved for the fine rapid and precise movements so they have got very short duration for the time whereas there are some uh, some fibers called as slow muscle fibers so principally those are involved in the strong gross and sustained movements like the movements of the back okay they are mainly for the postural so those uh, the duration of the twitch can go up to 100 milliseconds okay 100 milliseconds so we have got fast fibers and the slow muscle fibers so this is a table again taken from your ganon so this has been asked again a number of times what are the differences between your okay slow and fast fibers okay slow also called as type 1 fibers fast type 2 again in that you have got type 2a and type 2b okay so these are the various differences that you should know okay what is the color coming to color the type 1 that is red in color type 2a is also red in color whereas type 2b is white in color this is because of the presence of the myoglobin that's all okay myoglobin coming to the atpase activity it is very fast in the fast fibers okay whereas the atpase activity is very slow in the slow type of fibers okay coming to the calcium pumping activity again in the fast fibers the turnover is very high because it requires very fast pumping okay and fast contraction and relaxation coming to the diameter the uh, diameter is very small in case of uh, slow fibers and it is very large in case of fast fibers coming to the glycolytic capacity it is very high in the fast fibers glycol means energy which is required for the contraction again relaxation we require atp isn't it to get detached therefore the glycolytic pathway is very high okay and coming to the oxidative pathway is opposite here the oxidative pathway is high in the slow fibers oxidative capacity is high in the slow fibers whereas it is moderate or low in case of type 2 fibers okay coming to the associated type of the motor unit type it is slow okay whereas in case of uh, fast fibers it is the type 2a is fast resistant to fatigue means it is very resistant to fatigue means fatigue will not occur so easily 
but whereas in case of type 2 b fibers it is very fast fatigable so immediately the work will stop the muscle cannot contract further so muscle will, fibers will go for fatigue so this are the key differences between the slow and fast fiber so you please again revise so the only thing that you should know is glycolytic pathway is very high in both the type 2a and type uh, 2b whereas oxidative capacity is high in case of slow fibers that is type 1 and the type of uh, the motor unit that is fast fatigable in case of type 2b but resistant to fatigue in case of fast that is type 2a so you revise this again and again so these are the types of fibers slow fibers and the fast fibers okay fast fibers again this simple muscle twitch what i discussed the electrical response for a muscle fiber to repeated stimulation is like that of a nerve same like a nerve there is a electrical response even in case of muscle fiber the fiber is electrically refractory only during the rising phase so in the earlier you saw again there is a rising phase and the falling phase even, even in case of the muscle okay so at this time the concentration uh, the contraction that is initiated by the first stimulus is just the beginning and repeated stimulation before the relax so what happens suppose you are giving a one more stimulus in the relaxation phase of the uh, muscle okay that will add up that is called as summation so you will get a more height in contraction so if i want if i want to show it in a diagram suppose i will take this is the one contraction okay suppose you give one more stimulus during the relaxation phase what happens you will get one more so this is called as summation this is called as summation so you are going to give one more stimulus during the relaxation phase of the first relaxation of the muscle fiber okay so that will get summated and you will get a more height more contraction so we call it as more contraction okay have you understood this that is called a summation of the uh, response okay the tension developed during the summation is considerably greater so as there is a summation more strength there is a more tension that is developed okay with rapidly repeated stimulus if you go on stimulating the muscle fiber again and again and again so it will ultimately go for tetanus it will remain in the contracted state so it can be complete tetanus where there is no relaxation at all where there is no relaxation at all that is the complete tetanus there can be incomplete tetanus when there is a small relaxation phase in between where there is a small relaxation phase in between that is called as incomplete tetanus okay incomplete tetanus so this is the diagram so this is the incomplete tetanus once this this uh, diagram was asked by me so identify the diagram okay so this peak this is the complete tetanus okay there is no relaxation at all complete tetanus whereas this is incomplete tetanus incomplete tetanus so this is again diagram taken from your yanong itself okay now coming to the one more concept called as oxygen debt what is the mechanism or the reason behind the oxygen <coughs> oxygen debt mechanism now remember during exercise whenever you start doing exercise the muscle blood vessels dilate and the flow is increased so that more oxygen is available for the uh, glycolytic pathway or the oxidative pathway which is occurring in the muscle because atp has to be synthesized because the muscle has to relax now up to a certain point the increase in o2 consumption is proportional to the energy which is expended which is which which, which we are going to do expenditure okay all the energy needs to be met by the aerobic process here because oxygen is very much essential however when muscular exertion is very great if you do more okay aerobic resynthesis of energy stores cannot keep up with their utilization if you go on doing a heavy exercise so the aerobic mechanism cannot keep up the supply of atp under this condition what happens the phosphoryl creatine is used to resynthesize the atp the re reserved phosphoryl creatine is used for the resynthesis of atp and this atp is in turn used for the relaxation then okay in addition some of the atp also is accomplished by using the energy released by the anaerobic breakdown of the glucose to lactate now what happens if even if phosphoryl creatine is not sufficient to resynthesize atp the muscle will go for anaerobic mechanism to generate energy where glucose is converted to lactate okay the use of anaerobic pathway is self limiting because in spite of rapid diffusion of lactate into the blood stream it accumulates in the muscle the lactate when it goes on accumulating in the muscle it will decline the ph it will decline the ph 
further the muscle cannot do any exercise it cannot contract or relax so there is a self limitation so beyond certain point the lactate will go on accumulating and that will again stop or decline the ph of the muscle so now what happens in case of suppose if you want to give an example in case of 100 meter dash that takes only 10 seconds isn't it 10 seconds so here 85% of the energy is consumed derived from anaerobically even if the air is sufficient oxygen is not there also available also anaerobic metabolism is sufficient for this 100 meter dash so once this was asked question in 100 meter dash how the energy is derived it is anaerobically derived derived okay 85% is derived anaerobically so this was the answer and suppose if you are going for a 2 mile if you are going to run for a 2 mile race which will take 10 minutes here it was 10 seconds here it is 10 minutes so 20% of the energy is derived anaerobically okay only 20% is derived anaerobically rest 80% is derived aerobically okay in a long distance race that takes like a marathon if you go for 60 one hour running okay only 5% is from the anaerobic mechanism rest 95% you have to take it from oxygen only that is anaerobic mechanism only have you understood these three difference guys yes sir yes sir yeah remember this so this questions uh, have been already asked okay in 100 meter dash how much percentage is anaerobically used all those things okay just go through it okay now coming to the oxygen depth course, okay after a period of exertion so you are going for a marathon so after a period of exertion is over the extra o2 that is consumed to remove the excess of lactate so lactate has been accumulated in the body because some of the lactates are coming from the anaerobic pathway so to replenish the atp and phosphoryl creatinine stores to replace the small amounts of o2 is required here that is they were released from the myoglobin okay the small amounts of o2 that were released from the myoglobin to replenish this atp here so without the replenishment of atp here the muscle can enter into rega suppose if you don't replenish the atp you know what will happen if there is no atp the muscle will go for a state of rega so there should be some mechanism where atp should be replenished resynthesized so the extra amount of o2 consumed is proportional to the extent to which the energy demands during the exertion exceeded the capacity for the aerobic synthesis okay so during here what happened here is so there was an extra amount of debt that had been created so that is called as oxygen debt okay so this oxygen debt what happens now it is after the exercise is over you continue to breathe very hard very fast so during that time the atp is getting replenished because you had consumed more o2 in the beginning <clears throat> during that marathon race okay so that has to be replenished therefore <coughs> that o2 which you have consumed extra okay that is proportional to the that, that is the demand that you created depending upon the nature of the exercise or the duration of the exercise so that is called as oxygen debt so that has to be replenished by taking more breath that's after the exercise is over so experimentally this o2 debt can be measured how by determining the o2 consumption after exercise until a constant basal consumption is reached what happens once you stop the exercise you continue to breathe very fast okay you take deep breath breathe out deep okay after some time what happens it will come to normal constant basal consumption level okay to till that you are going to calculate and subtract it from the basal consumption okay so you have to subtract it from the basal consumption from the total consumption so whatever the difference you get here that is the o2 debt that is you are going to repay it because you had used it in the initial part of the exercise so the amount of this debt may be six times the basal consumption remember the oxygen debt can go as high as six times the basal oxygen consumption which indicates that the subject is capable six times the exertion that would be possible without it that means our body has got extra reservoir okay of energy which can be used okay that is six times it can be used and later it can be compensated that is by taking more breaths okay so this is called as oxygen debt to replenish the atp okay next coming to how to re record the this contractile mechanism okay the activation of the motor units can be studied by a process called as electromyography electromyography the process of recording the electrical activity in the muscle so that is called as electromyography 
the instrument used is electromyograph okay this is done in an unanesthetized un humans by placing a small metal disks over the skin over the muscle that metal will pick up the <coughs> electrical activity or by inserting a needle or a fine wire like electrodes into the muscle so either you can insert it or you can take one metal disk and keep it over the skin so that will pick up the electrical activity and it will project like this so this is a typical emg so you can see here flexion extension flexion extension whenever there is flexion okay so there is you can see the whenever so you can see uh, up going is flexion so whenever there is flexion so you can see this is the flexor emg electromyogram okay this is called electromyogram recording method is myography the instrument used is electromyograph whenever there is extension that is coming down you can see the electromyogram in the extensor group of muscles whenever there is flexion in flexor group of muscles you can see the electrical activity so this recording is called as electromyography the whatever the potential difference you are getting here flickering this is the electromyogram once this question was asked remember they will give you this example and they will ask what is this procedure or what is this graph what is this recording called as this recording is called as electromyogram electromyogram have you followed guys have you understood the electromyography here it is nothing but yes, the recording of the electrical activity in the muscle okay so this is called as electromyography okay this will complete your skeletal muscle part of the your nerve muscle physiology okay so in the coming class we will see a little about this smooth muscle and the cardiac muscle or whenever the uh, topics uh, are coming in that git or your urinary bladder or your uh, heart okay we will see uh, cardiac muscle and other things now this will complete the skeletal muscle okay have you any doubts guys have you got any doubts you can please ask no sir okay then we will wind up the class okay and we will meet in the next class okay thank you sir thank you sir yeah